Guten Tag. Sie haben gerade Thank Spaß. You. Ähm, One second, I have to, once it's live, I have to make sure that once it, because it's 30 seconds lag between the live and I have to mute it in the software's website. Once it's gone live, I can talk. Yeah, yeah, you heard yourself in there as a background. And then I'm going to show this. You guys see that, right? Okay. Yeah, we do. I go on my official timer, which is, of course, my iPhone now. That's the timekeeper of the world now, nowadays. Oh, sorry. Okay, I think uh, it's now 3 p.m. Uh, so thank you, everybody, um, uh, for joining us once again to the online SPICE SPIN Plus X seminars um, here that we organize in the SPIN Phenomenal Entity Planner Center. Uh, myself, Claire Sinova with Angela Bittman. A professor here, and uh, Karen Ebersol City, professor in Duisburg, and now in collaboration with the Spin Plus S Collaborative Research Center led by Martina Schliemann and Burkhard Hillebrams in Kasselslatten and Matthias Chloe, our colleague here in Mainz. As you know, this is a webinar format, so you will see the speaker, uh, people in the panel, and uh, uh, you can write your Q&As afterwards or hand, raise your hand and then I will give you the floor to ask the questions after the talk. Uh, as usually, they're scheduled at 3 p.m. Uh, just as an announcement, there's several when there's a workshop going on. We're not going to interfere with those workshops so there will not be a talk. And I wanted to announce at least uh, three of the online workshops, uh, so not online, in-person workshops that we have here uh, at the end of June, uh, the non-equilibrium emergent in quantum design, the Young Research Leaders Group's uh, workshop um, uh, here in Mainz uh, at the beginning of July, and at the end of July, the Orbitronics workshop. Uh, there's also an other workshop that I wanted to announce in August that we will have a break in August and at the beginning of September, uh, just because we've been running for a long time here. Uh, the Spin Mechanics uh, 7 that is organized uh, in near Halle, uh, in particular this in, in Gerolfingen, uh, by George Smith, uh, and here's the information that you would, may want to check it out, as well as in September, uh, it's organized by Stefano Bonetti and in collaboration with us with SPICE, uh, Trends in Magnetism by Peter Spint uh, uh, in Magnet, Ferromagnetism and Light in Venice uh, 4th of the night. Unfortunately, overlapping with the DPG meeting, uh, but, you know, you know, Regensburg by uh, Venice, you know, we shall see. <laughs> Um, so just with this, uh, it is my great pleasure to act into this uh, Jeffrey Beach, uh, as a professor uh, in material science at MIT, um, graduated from Caltech and got his PhD at the University of California um, in the 2003, so we have similar uh, ages, but also uh, the nice thing with us, we know each other long ago as well, uh, for a long time, uh, because we have a lab in the University of Texas as uh, when we were young and uh, had a little less gray hair and definitely not a beard anymore uh, at the time. Um, he's uh, very well known in the field of spintronics and uh, schematics as well. Uh, he's the science uh, transmagnetic and ionic materials, uh, particularly in, in very beautiful experiments, the spin base, uh, going, looking at memory logic uh, and, and applic you know, focusing a lot on those applications. Uh, he's a IEEE senior member and an IPS fellow since 2020. And a recipient of the IEEE uh, Magnetic Society in his career in 2021. So, with this, I'm going to stop sharing and I uh, will be go ahead and uh, um, uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and start sharing. Okay, perfect. So, I will mute myself here and give you the floor, uh, Jeffrey. And we're looking forward to your talk. Okay, and just to be sure, the uh, the visual is showing okay? Yeah, the sure, slides are showing? Sure. Yeah, okay, perfect. perfect. Okay, well, thank you very much for the for the kind introduction and for the, the invitation to speak in this uh, in this forum. So I'm really delighted to have the opportunity. So today I'm going to uh, describe some of the work uh, uh, going on in the field and particularly in our group. Uh, looking at spin textures, looking at, at magnetic skirmions and domain walls, beginning with ferromagnets, magnets, uh, but moving towards ferrite magnets, uh, which is a materials class that we and I think the community have been 
become particularly interested in in the last few years. And she'll show you a few manifestations of spin dynamics, domain wall and uh, skirmion dynamics in these multi sublattice materials. This work has been done uh, uh, with uh, my group uh, together with collaborators from a variety of individuals at both at MIT and at several institutions across the, the world, some of which are shown here, and I'm sure there are many that, I, that I've uh, forgotten to list. So in most magnetic materials, uh, uh, the spin configurations are either parallel or anti-parallel because of a Heisenberg exchange interaction that prefers collinear alignment of spins that gives us ferromagnets and anti-ferromagnets. In some materials with a broken inversion symmetry and strong, strong enough spin orbit coupling, uh, there's a chiral interaction known as the zalashinsky maria interaction, and that prefers spins to uh, align orthogonal with one another as opposed to collinear, and it, it prefers to have a particular chirality, so a left-handed versus a right-handed uh, chirality, one of those would have a lower energy than the other. When both of these interactions are present, one can have a very rich spin textures in materials, spin spirals can be a ground state, or very interestingly, magnetic skirmions can be a ground state. And a magnetic skirmion can be thought of in a simple way as a domain wall that's wrapped around itself uh, to give a circular domain, and that domain can be very small. But one thing that makes this kind of spin texture uh, particularly interesting is that it is topologically protected. That is, there are no defects in the spin winding, so there is no way to continuously deform a magnetic skirmion from its existence to the ground state or vice versa. So there's a, a topological barrier in the spin fabric that protects it. And so these kinds of uh, structures, both domain walls, but, but importantly, skirmions, are very interesting from both fundamental and practical perspectives. Magnetic skirmions can interact with, with one another to form lattices. There are melting and freezing transitions and so forth. They can interact with electric currents that allows for their drive, in some cases at very low current densities. That interaction can go both ways. So when uh, uh, spin currents interact with spin textures like magnetic skirmions, there can be phenomena that are known as emergent electrodynamics. So things like a topological Hall effect um, and uh, 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 device applications. So magnetic spin textures are, are localized uh, uh, objects. Uh, that can be transported in appropriate structures. They can be used to encode information and they can be used to propagate that information. And so one, if, if one can realize these kinds of spin textures uh, and make them small enough and fast enough and uh, uh, easy enough to manipulate, then one can do interesting things with them from device perspectives, such as make uh, uh, very small form factor devices for memory and logic. So racetrack devices or logic devices where the presence or absence of a skirmion or interaction of a skirmion with some other element in a structure allows for computation uh, in a solid state device. Uh, so let me jump here. So the chiral interactions, the zelshinsky maria interaction is most commonly seen in bulk materials. Uh, there are a few bulk magnetic crystals in, in nature that lack an inversion center. And so these materials like iron cobalt silicon uh, can under appropriate conditions. So that is under appropriate ranges of magnetic field or temperature exhibit an, a, a skirmion lattice phase. And so there's a lot of interesting physics and potential applications in such material. The other place where one finds a broken inversion symmetry naturally is that inter interfaces or surfaces and at inappropriate materials and at an interface or a surface, there can be a strong interfacial zelishinsky maria interaction that likewise can generate uh, uh, non-uniform spin textures, so spin spirals or magnetic skirmions. And in fact, such uh, textures, particularly skirmions, have been seen to be very small uh, under under conditions at least at very low temperature down to atomic scale by spin polarized STM. Uh, initial observations in, uh, in thin films or at surfaces were only at low temperature um, and only in, in uh, 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 rather difficult to prepare uh, single crystal or apotaxial films, but it was uh, uh, discovered some number of years ago that at a variety of interfaces, both in, in uh, single crystal or polycrystalline materials, that the presence of an interface between a ferromagnet and a heavy metal, so something like iron or cobalt or nickel, interface with something like platinum or tantalum, can give rise to an, in, an interfacial zalashinsky maria interaction that can be quite strong and that can be quite robust against defects at, at the interface. And this can generate um, 
uh, spiral spin textures. It can generate chiral domain walls that can be readily driven in these kinds of structures by electric current by virtue of the spin hall currents that are generated in the heavy metal under current flow. And these materials, uh, uh, these kinds of interactions, it turns out are ubiquitous in exactly the kinds of, of bilayers and multilayers that are broadly used in spintronic devices. Uh, so this makes these kinds of materials, if one can engineer them appropriately, uh, 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 both ideal to study the fundamental phenomena, but, but, but potentially of practical use because they could be integrated into devices that allow a readout through something like a magnetic tunnel junction. So very rapidly after the discovery of interfacial DMI at room temperature in polycrystalline materials, a number of groups, including our own, uh, were able to image uh, circular structures uh, that are topologically protected. So magnetic skirmions that tended to be rather large on the order of 100 nanometers or, or larger in tailored multilayer materials. So things like platinum cobalt tantalum was a structure that we uh, looked at. Uh, uh, iridium cobalt platinum is a structure another group has looked at. And, and the idea between, behind these kinds of structures is that by taking a ferromagnet and embedding it uh, between two dissimilar materials, you build in a broken inversion symmetry. And by tuning those materials, one can amplify both the DMI and one can amplify the spin orbit uh, uh, torques that can be used to, to, to uh, uh, control or drive spin textures in these materials as well. Uh, in these kinds of structures, it's been shown experimentally by Bowers and a number of groups that these kinds of uh, at least larger skirmions, bubble-like skirmions can be driven in racetrack-like devices. This drive can be relatively uh, uh, reproducible and the speeds can be relatively fast on the order of 100, uh, 100 meters per second. Uh, and so this is desirable for devices. This is quite exciting for devices. Uh, magnetic skirmions can be uh, written in racetrack devices. This has been shown by our group and, and a number of other groups, uh, both uh, uh, with simulations and with experimental work. I won't go through the details of, of this uh, as of yet, but using ferromagnetic multilayers based on a ferromagnet sandwich between two dissimilar uh, metals or a metal and an oxide, many of the requisite functionalities, uh, at least in principle for a device have been demonstrated. And even phenomena uh, uh, like ultra fast generation of, of magnetic skirmions. Several groups, including our own, have shown recently that in ferromagnetic multilayer stacks, ultra fast uh, femtosecond laser pulses can be used to generate either groups of magnetic skirmions or individual skirmions and can do so in racetrack devices to allow for the ultra fast creation, translation, and annihilation of magnetic skirmions in, in devices. So there's been a tremendous amount of progress since the discovery of, of interfacial DMI in the engineering of uh, ferromagnetic stacks with dissimilar interfaces to generate these kinds of chiral textures and to generate the kinds of, of uh, uh, conditions that allow for their manipulation uh, in potential racetrack devices or other logic devices for applications. Now, one of the, the problems in these kinds of structures is that much of the excitement it, it, uh, at the beginning of uh, work in the field on magnetic experiments was the desire uh, or the possibility to have extremely small textures. So textures down to atomic scale, as I mentioned before, had been seen in uh, monolayer or bilayer films on uh, uh, single crystalline uh, substrates. But in multilayer stacks, magnetic skirmions really across the board are, are typically very large. Uh, usually uh, 100 nanometers or larger and seldom smaller than about 50 nanometers. And in that case, those kinds of sizes are only achieved by applying external magnetic fields that can squeeze the magnetic skirmions down. And the reason for that is that in a single film, in a very thin film versus a multi-layer stack, the stray fields are very different. And as, as uh, uh, we've shown in the public publication shown down at the bottom right, it is these stray field interactions that make it relatively easy to create and stabilize magnetic skirmions in multi-layer stacks. While these stacks have DMI in a, in a single layer film, the kinds of films that have been explored by uh, spin polarized STM, it is the DMI that is primarily responsible for the stability of a, of a skirmion. Whereas in a multi-layer stack, the DMI is responsible for controlling the chirality of a skirmion. 
to make it nail and so forth. But the energetic stability of that spermion and the ease with which it can be created and stabilized is really due to the stray fields. So the energetics is that of a magnetic bubble, but with the DMI, that magnetic bubble has a chirality that allows it to be manipulated in a controllable way and so forth in these kinds of uh, structures. But going hand in hand with that is the fact that the stray fields that are responsible for the stability of, of these kinds of topological structures necessarily lead to much larger magnetic skirmions than one would desire for applications. Again, typically on the order of tens or even hundreds of, of nanometers in materials. So that's not desirable. So the stray field interactions make it easier to achieve a magnetic skirmion, but they really limit the static properties of a, of a magnetic skirmion. Um, they lead not only to, to larger sizes, but very complex, both static and dynamics of these spin textures. So uh, we now understand that in uh, magnetic multilayers, the stray fields not only stabilize this bubble-like skirmion as, as a whole, but the stray fields cause interactions from one layer to the next that will lead to complicated through thickness uh, 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 spin textures in these materials. So closure stray fields, will lead to, even in the case of zero DMI for a magnetic skirmion in, in, in a uh, multi-layer, uh, nail kinds of textures where the handedness of the nail structure on the bottom of the stack versus the top of the stack is inverted because of closure stray fields uh, that go through the thickness of the, of the film. And this has been observed by NV magnetometry and X-ray uh, uh, imaging in these kinds of structures. And we can understand that uh, uh, and, and we've shown in, in the PRB article reference in the bottom here that the stray fields actually mathematically appear uh, as something that looks like a DMI. So if one has a magnetic multilayer in which there is no DMI, the closure stray fields will lead to block textures at the top and in the bottom. And right near the middle of the stack, uh, the, the uh, structure will be uh, sorry, nail at the top and the bottom. And right near the middle of st the stack, the structure will be block. As one adds DMI to the film that prefers one handedness versus the other for the nail texture, that will tend to push this node towards one of the interfaces. So more and more of the layers become nail with a particular handedness, and one can compute this. But the stray field interaction itself uh, uh, turns out to look exactly like an effective DMI, and that effective DMI applies uh, uh, layer by layer by summing up the stray fields from all of the other layers. And it can either uh, uh, add to or subtract from a DMI that is in induced at interfaces in these materials. So this node can be pushed through the, the film, but that, that gives a few, a few consequences. It takes a much higher DMI in a multi-layer to get a fully nailed structure. But also that node in the middle where the stray field-like interaction is exactly balanced by the DMI so the green arrow shown here is very, very uh, uh, non-stiff. So that is to say uh, the, the energy that wants it to be block and the energy that wants it to be nail are almost completely balanced. So the energy or the torque that's required to cause that layer to process is very, very low. And that precession is exactly what limits the high-speed dynamics. So not only is there a very large DMI that's required to have the structure fully nail statically, uh, but the stiffness of the domain wall, which protects it against precession during translation and precession of a, of a domain wall uh, or any texture during translation uh, is something that's known as Walker breakdown. That transition uh, turns out to be at a very small, uh, a much smaller velocity threshold for multilayers than it tends to be for continuous films. So as a, a, a domain wall or a skirmion is, is uh, traveling through a material, there's a critical velocity at which a layer will process. And that critical velocity is proportional to the stiffness. So proportional to whatever is the energy term that is holding it as a nail or holding it as a, as a, as a block wall. And in magnetic multilayers, uh, we've shown computationally that that critical velocity can be very, very small. And again, because it is proportional to the stiffness of the domain wall, and that stiffness right at that node can be very, very low, then precession will tend to, to uh, uh, begin within a domain wall within at least a few of these layers at a very low velocity, and that will destabilize it. And one can see the same kind of thing with skirmions. And so if 
this is a simulation that shows a multi-layer skirmion and the three rows in the bottom show different individual layers within that skirmion. And the one that, that corresponds to layer 12 here is where that node is statically. So that is statically uh, the magnetic skirmion in that layer is block, but the stiffness between block and nail is very low. So at a quite a low driving uh, current and therefore at a very low velocity, there are block points that form and that slows the progression of the entire uh, skirmion in, in a structure. So stray field interactions, while they, while they can help to stabilize statically a, a, a skirmion and, and hold it in a circular form, they're really, de really detrimental for both the static, the size, and for the dynamics. And so let me step through some of these equations. So if, if one wants to improve the, the behavior and really push skirmions down to a limit of 10 nanometers or, or less that would make them desirable for applications, but also uh, uh, imbue them with the kinds of high-speed dynamics that would be required for high-speed manipulation, one thing that one has to do is get rid of the stray fields. And so one way to do that is by moving to multi-sublattice materials like ferromagnets or antiferromagnets. And so uh, Felix Butner, in, uh, when he was in my group, uh, developed an, an analytical theory uh, that have several onsatses for the various energy terms uh, for magnetic skirmions that allows for a very rapid computation of the material's parameter space to try to understand uh, both the energy barrier for uh, an annihilation of a skirmion, so the stability, and also the size of a magnetic skirmion. And what was found was that there's really a trade-off between size and stability, uh, at least for ferro ferromagnetic skirmions. But for ferromagnetic skirmions, or materials with, with lower stray fields, and let me step to the key point here, and one of the target materials that we looked at was cobalt gadolinium. Uh, in these kinds of materials, you can uh, uh, reduce and even eliminate stray fields in these materials, which allows you to make the film much thicker. But by virtue of making the film much thicker, the energy that, that protects a skirmion from annihilation is really a volume energy. And so if you want to make a skirmion smaller in diameter, so smaller in the plane, uh, in order to imbue it with enough energy uh, uh, to protect it against collapse, you desire to make the film thicker. So the smaller the, the skirmion is, the thicker the film needs to be so that the volume energy that stabilizes that skirmion is enough to, to fight the uh, thermal energy. With ferrimagnets, that can, that can happen, particularly with rare earth transition metal ferrimagnets, uh, because there is uh, 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 not only a reasonably large exchange interaction, but there's a bulk contribution to the, to the magnetic anisotropy, such that with, in addition with the lack of stray fields, one can make these films relatively thick. And we had computed that for films on the order of, of several nanometers thick, uh, uh, with parameters of cobalt gadolinium, that skirmions with sizes of the order of 10 nanometers or less should be stable and should be stable at room temperature. And so we went about uh, 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 demonstrating that experimentally uh, by using X-ray holography, which is an X-ray technique that, that gives very fine resolution, spatial resolution, and it has elemental sensitivity uh, uh, to spin, orbit, to spin or, uh, ordering. So that even in a compensated material, by looking at one sublattice, you can distinguish the magnetic textures in, in a material. Uh, we were able to, in a tuned cobalt gadolinium film, so in this case, uh, 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 cobalt 56 gadolinium 44, about six nanometers thick, again with asymmetric interfaces, uh, uh, stabilize and nucleate with electric current pulses, magnetic skirmions in, in this material. Uh, these skirmions are, are, are stable at room temperature. They are stable at relatively large magnetic fields. And the sizes are on the order of tens of, of nanometers. There was a relatively large distribution of sizes in these, uh, in these materials uh, uh, with a, a, a diameter averaging about 20 nanometers. And these at the time were the smallest skirmions that had been uh, uh, seen in a material. And again, have been seen to be stable both uh, at room temperature for reasonably long times and under large magnetic fields. But one can also look by virtue of the size distribution that the stability isn't infinitely long. So after nucleating several, several of these skirmions and just watching them over time, one can 
see manifestations of the volume energy that keeps them stable. The smaller skirmion that you see circled in red annihilates after something of the order of tens of minutes, whereas the larger skirmion tends to be more stable and lives for much longer in these, uh, in these materials. So looking at the, at the dynamics of these kinds of structures, uh, uh, stray fields or really uncompensated uh, uh, sublattices lead to other dynamics that are undesirable for devices, namely a skirmion hall effect. And the skirmion hall effect uh, is just a phenomena that happens when one tries to drive in a linear trajectory something that has a gyrotropic nature to it. So think of spinning baseball um, or think of magnetic skirmion. Magnetic skirmion has a topological charge to it. And therefore, if you apply a force, say a force uh, uh, applied to the skirmion using a magnetic current, so using the, the spin hall torque, and you try to drive it along the racetrack, because of the topological charge or because of the, the topological nature of this uh, structure, there will be a, a gyrotropic force that is transverse to the direction in which you're pushing it. And so that will cause a magnetic skirmion to take a trajectory that is not along the, the racetrack if you're driving a current, but is it an angle and it will eventually drive it towards the edge. And of course, this is something that one doesn't desire uh, uh, for uh, magnetic skirmions in a racetrack. And this is something that we've seen in ferromagnets. So it's something that is, that is intrinsic to ferromagnetic skirmions. So on a racetrack uh, uh, made of cobalt iron boron, so this is multi-layer track with relatively large 100 nanometer skirmions. Uh, we were able with pump probe microscopy to drive skirmions back and forth in a track billions of times and using pump probe, look at the dynamic trajectory of these skirmions. And one sees that all of the skirmions move at an angle with respect to the current flow. And that angle is the skirmion hall angle. And uh, uh, so it's, it's very encouraging these structures that one can drive reproducibly a skirmion back and forth this number of cycles, because that would be very important for any kinds of, of device application. But if one scales this down to have racetracks that are, that are tens of nanometers wide, of course, the skirmion is going to run into the, into the edge. And so this is something that's undesirable for, for application. Um, when one goes to multi-sublattice materials, so compensated ferri magnets or anti ferro magnets, one can recast the, the LLG equation in such a way that the gyrotropic term uh, vanishes. And I won't go through the deal, details of this, but Typically in a ferromagnet, when you apply a magnetic field, the magnetization will process around that field and eventually will damp towards that field direction. But it's somewhat of, of an indirect uh, drive process, an indirect switching process. And that processional motion is responsible things like Skirmian Hall effect and Walker breakdown and so forth. But in a, in a material uh, with multiple sublattices that is uh, at or very near compensation, the processional term will tend to vanish in a modified LLG equation. And so the dynamics then are, are direct. If you drive a skirmion, it will move in the direction that you uh, uh, push it, not at an angle to that. Or a magnetic domain wall will no longer experience processional dynamics that leads to Walker breakdown. And in fact, all of these effects for spin textures, Walker breakdown, skirmion hall effect, uh, there are current driven velocity limits for domain walls. Um, that are due to processional motion, something I've not described here, but, but a form of a topological damping for skirmions that, that limits their velocity. All of these are related to the gyrotropic nature of, of dynamics in, uh, uh, in ferromagnetic materials. All of these uh, 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 undesirable processes vanish when a material is fully compensated. And so that's, that's something that, uh, that, that we and many are very interested in the field. And one way that one can explore this is with ferry magnets. And in uh, rare transition metal alloys, which I'll, I'll come back to several times in this talk, these materials are, 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 are quite uh, uh, interesting and useful because by controlling either the composition uh, of the rare earth with respect to the transition metal or by tr controlling the temperature because the two sublattices have different temperature dependencies. One can control the degree of compensation in these materials and actually explore the, the change in the nature of the dynamics between gyrotropic or not. And so it's been shown uh, uh, under driving field that uh, magnetic domain walls that away from compensation process, which leads to a limiting velocity. 
as one goes to, towards compensation, in this case controlled by temperature, very fast velocities can be achieved because the precessional motion that tends to limit that velocity, uh, well, that critical velocity at which precession takes over will tend to diverge uh, towards the compensation point. Uh, we've looked at the same phenomena in the same material class that I showed you that we can uh, achieve very small skirmions. So cobalt catalinium alloy, in this case driven not by magnetic fields, but by spin orbit torques, using a platinum layer adjacent to the cobalt catalinium as a spin current source. And in these ma materials, uh, uh, we have a compensation temperature that's a bit below room temperature. And so by using a, a, a controlled cryostat, we can tune through compensation and explore the current driven dynamics. And so we've done this, this using uh, 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 MOC, where we can drive a magnetic domain wall along a track and track the velocity as a function of the degree of compensation. And we found exactly as, as one would expect that when you are away from compensation, the, the, uh, the maximum velocity for the magnetic domain wall is relatively low on the order of hundreds of meters per per second, but uh, there is a temperature at which the velocity becomes very large in excess of a kilometer per second. Uh, but that temperature does not correspond to the magnetic compensation temperature. It corresponds instead to the uh, angular momentum compensation temperature. So in a rare earth transition metal alloy, the cobalt here and the gadolinium have different G factors. So there is a, in, and the, the sublattice moments have different temperature dependence. So there is a temperature at which the sublattice moments balance one another. And that's the temperature at which the net magnetization is zero. And there's a different temperature at which the angular momentum balances uh, uh, one another on the sublattices. And at the magnetic compensation temperature, there is finite angular momentum. At the angular momentum compensation temperature, there is finite magnetization. But the dynamics uh, 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 is driven by angular momentum. And in fact, the, the drive by spin orbit torques is a transfer of angular momentum from electrons to the, to the lattice. And so the angular momentum really controls the dynamics in these kinds of systems. And we can see that experimentally. Um, uh, when we look at, at these kinds of, of materials, look not just at domain walls, but magnetic skirmions, uh, we have looked at cobalt gadolinium, both near and away from compensation. Uh, we've looked at stray field stabilized skirmions, and we've looked at, at uh, uh, skirmions near the magnetic compensation temperature in which stray fields play a much smaller role. Uh, magnetic skirmions in these materials can be relatively circular, or they can be very large. And so that the, the structure, the geometry of skirmions can vary significantly. But for all of these, the topology is the same. So that's what that what is what makes topology interesting. One can distort a skirmion structurally, but maintain the same topology. And then these materials, we've looked at the velocity versus, versus uh, uh, current. And we find likewise that very large velocities, uh, uh, comparable to velocities of domain walls can be achieved on the order of several hundreds of meters per, per, per second. So using uh, 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 ferromagnetic materials at or near compensation, can allow experimentally to have very small skirmions, to have stable skirmions at room temperature, and to have exceedingly high velocities, uh, with all of these attributes being significantly better than one can achieve using, using a, a, a ferromagnets. They also allow for uh, uh, controlling the, the skirmion hull effect. And so this was shown in, in a very nice paper a couple of years ago, looking at um, a, a magnetic skirmion or a, a bubble and looking at the expansion of this. So it's not a translational motion, but nonetheless, uh, a, a dynamics that can be understood uh, in terms of <coughs> a con control of the, of the uh, uh, skirmion hull effect, in this case by, by temperature. And so all of these uh, uh, bode, uh, bode well in using ferrite magnets for, uh, for applications in, in uh, uh, devices. And in terms of, of writing, so uh, I described this very, very earlier in, in the talk, but in, in a racetrack, you not only need to uh, 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 be able to translate and of course read magnetic skirmions, but you need to, to control them. You need to initialize them. You need to write them. There've been a variety of, of proposals made uh, 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 to do this, typically uh, thinking about ferromagnets using either localized electric current injection or a global current injection with a localized 
uh, in homogeneity, maybe a notch or a, a change in the anisotropy or so forth. And this has been shown experimentally, as I showed at the beginning of, of the talk, in this case, by using notches. Current pulses can be used to nucleate in a controlled way, a magnetic skirmish on a track that can then be translated along the track. But current pulses cost energy. And energy, again, is, is what you want to minimize. That's one of the things that makes spintronic devices uh, potentially of utility compared to con conventional devices. But the current densities that are required to, you know, both to translate, but certainly to nucleate magnetic skirmions are, are quite high and certainly much higher right now than would be <coughs> allowable for a real device application. So another way to do this is by using electric fields. And uh, there have been a number of, of proposals, some experimental demonstrations of using uh, a, a gate voltage to uh, uh, control, for example, the magnetic anisotropy uh, uh, localized in, in a region of a film that could allow the creation of a magnetic texture like a magnetic skirmium. Um, electric fields typically are used to control anisotropy at the interface between a magnetic metal and a non-magnetic insulator. So something like cobalt iron boron adjacent to MGO. And by using either the electric field at that interface or controlling the electron density, it's possible to control the magnetic anisotropy. Although the, the control of that anisotropy is relatively weak typically. So considering that the magnitude of the anisotropy that is required for thermal stability of a, of a bit, for example, the change in interface anisotropy of using electric fields is only a few percent typically. Um, uh, there's another approach that, that uh, uh, my group and a number of other groups have, have been working on that is using uh, ionic control in heterostructures to control things like magnetic anisotropy or, or other properties. And what we found is that ferrimagnets are, are a beautiful host to use ionic control to control individually the sublattices and allow for local electric field writing of, of spin textures. So we showed some number of years ago using a gate oxide in which the gate oxide is, is not, not a passive oxide, but really an active oxide, that one can use a gate voltage to move oxygen towards or away from an interface and control uh, perpendicular magnetic anisotropy in a thin cobalt film. Uh, we have discovered subsequent to that that we can use other ions as well. Most interestingly, perhaps, is, is, is a proton. And in structures where one has a metal oxide metal stack, um, uh, like in this case, cobalt gadolinium oxide, which is our, our gate oxide of choice, and gold at the top, by just applying a gate voltage in the ambient atmosphere of a couple of volts, that gate voltage is enough to split uh, water so just water from ambient humidity and harnessed a proton that can be pumped through the gadolinium oxide, which acts as a solid state ionic conductor. And that proton can then be injected as hydrogen into a, mat into a metallic film beneath it. That'll, that allows for a control not only of interface effects, but also bulk effects. And as I'll show you with, with ferry magnets, it leads to some really interesting and, and, and quite beautiful behavior. Um, so in cobalt gadolinium, uh, there's a, a compensation behavior because the, the magnitude of the cobalt and the gadolinium moments um, are different, but they also have a different uh, uh, temperature dependence. And so at a fixed temperature, if one adjusts the comp composition of these, one can exactly compensate if one so desires. And so the, the figure on the right shows a, a way of doing that by controlling the amount of gadolinium in a material then at room temperature, where the coercivity diverges, that's where MS goes to zero. And one can also do this by temperature. So for a fixed composition, since the cobalt and gadolinium moments vary differently with temperature, then there can be, uh, depending on the composition, a temperature at which they exactly balance one another. And these are the typical ways in, in which one controls compensation in a ferry magnet, either comp composition or temperature or some combination of the, of the two. So what we have found is that there's another way that we can do this by gate voltage uh, at room temperature. So using cobalt gadolinium, where we build an asymmetric structure, but on the top is an oxide that works as a good ionic conductor. We have found that in the virgin state, and I'm gonna show some moch hysteresis loops, and the moch uh, is sensitive to the transition metal sublattice. So even at compensation, if we switch the orientation of sublattices, we can see that as a, as a change in the contrast or the hysteresis loop. And so in the version state, we measure a particular polarity of the Moch loop. The absolute polarity is not important here, but the relative polarity is. 
when we gate this structure, so the, we hydrogenate it, the polarity inverts. And so that means at positive magnetic field, in one case, the cobalt is pointing up, in the other case, the cobalt is pointing down. And since at positive magnetic field, always the dominant sublattice will point parallel to the magnetic field, that means by gating it, we've changed the dominant sublattice. So we've driven it through compensation. And we can reverse that by applying a negative gate voltage to pull the hydrogen back out of the film. So at room temperature at a given composition, we can switch the compensation state. In fact, we can, in, in an analog way, drive the system arbitrarily across composition. Uh, and we can control that, we can change the compensation temperature by a significant amount, by at least 100 degrees, and that was limited only by the, by the uh, uh, cryostat that we have available to us. Um, we can do this uh, uh, repeatedly. So by applying a gate voltage of a positive and negative polarity, you can see dynamically the hysteresis loop that we can drive it through compensation one way or the other, again at a fixed temperature. And since we're changing the, the dominant sublattice, then that would allow either a field or in fact a spin orbit torque to have a different action on the, the, uh, on the magnetic configuration of the system in one of these states versus the, the other. So we've done a, a number of interesting things with these, but we've also found, you know, ionic devices are, are typically not well thought of in terms of, of speed and reproducibility, uh, but we can cycle these kinds of materials for tens of thousands of cycles without any irreversible effects to the material. And we can derive switching quite, uh, quite fast. So let me just skip through this one. So we've achieved with relatively large voltage pulses, switching of the sublattices at speeds uh, uh, of the order of 10 microseconds, which isn't fast on, on, you know, on the scale of spin orbit torque switching, but in terms of ionic devices, since the discovery of, of this nascent subfield magnetoionics in 2015, this is a factor 10 to the seven improvement in, in speed. And in terms of, of energy, well, let me show you the, the skirmion first. We can, we can create structures that we can locally gate and with an appropriate field and current uh, 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 protocol, we can create magnetic domains, pairs of domain walls or create magnetic skirmions in a racetrack device, which as I've shown you before, this is the same material class that can host very small skirmions and the same material class that can host very, very fast skirmions. So this is a, a very interesting way potentially in which one can integrate gating into a device to allow for uh, uh, these kinds of, of localized functionalities. And in terms of, of power consumption, let me step through all of the, the animations. Um, as opposed to an electric current, uh, because of the very small leakage currents in these devices and the very small scale at which they can be made, the right energy to create a skirmion is exceptionally small. Experimentally on, on tens of micron area devices, uh, we've de demonstrated 50 femtojoule writing. And that writing energy scales as the area for these structures, just simply as the area. So by making reasonably small gated areas, we expect to be able to write skirmions or write domain walls or gate and control them in a racetrack uh, at energies that are comparable or below those of a biological synapse. So even if the speeds aren't extremely fast, the possibility to, with analog and local control, uh, uh, nucleate, control, controllably pin, and so forth, uh, uh, magnetic textures and these kinds of, of, of ferrimagnetic uh, materials could have very interesting applications for devices. So finally, I just want to uh, uh, look at a different class of, of ferrimagnets for a few slides and, and address the, the question, how fast can spin textures propagate? And so we've been working with, uh, with Caroline Ross at, at MIT, uh, who has a lot of expertise in uh, uh, growing uh, uh, rare earth iron garnets. And these are materials that uh, within the, the, the iron garnet class, uh, GIG is perhaps the most well known and that's the material that has the lowest damping in, uh, in nature. By adding a rare earth uh, to such a material, one can induce things like a perpendicular anisotropy. As I'll show you later, one can induce a, a zalashinsky maria interaction. While the damping does go, go up a little bit, um, it still remains considerably lower than, than what one has in, in metals. And in addition, as opposed to metals in which the currents that drive the dynamics also dissipate energy, pure spin currents can be used to, to drive dynamics in insulating uh, uh, magnets. 
and that can be done potentially with much lower uh, uh, energy. And so we've been very interested in these kinds of materials, which again are multi sublattice ferromagnets that can be tuned to have many of the same dynamics as I've shown you for the for the metals, but other properties that you can't achieve with metals that we think could be quite uh, quite interesting. And so. Uh, uh, these materials, uh, the growth of, of a whole palette of these materials has really been perfected by, uh, by Professor Ross's uh, 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 team um, to get perpendicular anisotropy, to control the magnitude of the anisotropy uh, for thick films down to very thin films, down to films on the order of a, of a couple of unit cells. Um, we demonstrated back in 2017 that in thulium iron garnet with perpendicular anisotropy by putting a platinum layer on top, uh, one can uh, use current injection to switch the magnetization in the same way as you can do it with a, with a platinum cobalt bilayer. We've shown that this can be done uh, uh, repeatedly. This can be done at, at, at quite low current densities. So we, we know then in this case for the first time that you can pump enough spin current from a, a metal like platinum into a, a, an insulating ferrite magnet to actually uh, uh, effectuate switching. That then that one gives hope that you could also drive domain walls and other textures in these materials. And that's exactly what we have uh, uh, seen. So by making racetracks of thulium iron garnet with platinum on top, we've shown that you can drive domain walls to, to reasonably high velocities at reasonably low currents. And while I won't go through all of the, the, the uh, details, uh, we've shown that in these kinds of structures, there is a zalashinsky maria interaction. So an interfacial DMI that stabilizes nail walls that can be efficiently driven by spin orbit torques in these materials. And that was a big surprise to us. We, we expected to be able to drive domain walls in these materials because we knew we could switch magnetization with spin orbit torques, but we didn't think that there would be DMI. And uh, interestingly, there, there was. And so let me step through a couple of, of these because I don't want to go too far over. Um, but uh, in the publication shown at the bottom right, we have a, a protocol to quantify the DMI. And what this essentially is, is a nail wall will be driven in, in a direction by, by spin orbit torque that depends on whether it is left-handed or, or right-handed. And if a domain wall is blocked, then it won't be driven at all. And so if one has a nail domain wall and that nail domain wall is pointing to the right, one can see how much current in, in, in essence it takes to drive it then one can apply a magnetic field anti-parallel to that so that you rotate that domain wall from nail pointing one way to block to nail pointing the other way. And that transition point when you drive it to block is the point at which the in-plane magnetic field compensates the DMI. And so we can, we can compute that, we can quantify it by looking at domain wall dynamics. And so we've done that for a variety of, of, uh, of films. We've looked first as a function of thickness and for thulium iron garnet, when we look at the DMI, which in this figure you can take as the zero crossing of these data. So that's the, the, the field at which the domain wall is blocked. Uh, we find that the magnitude of the DMI decreases as the thickness increases. And so that points to, uh, uh, that points to, a, to a, uh, uh, an interfacial origin of the DMI. So that D scales as one over thickness. And let me skip through the equations here. Yeah, but let me come to this to this point. It turns out that the DMI here is very small. So the DMI is about two orders of magnitude smaller than what one finds at a cobalt platinum interface. But because the, the threshold of DMI that is required to stabilize a, a nail domain wall. So if you don't have a, a, a domain wall, if you don't have DMI, domain walls tend to be blocked. And the energy difference between a nail and a block is completely magnetostatic. You can essentially think of a domain wall itself as a rectangular prism. And that rectangular prism has a shape anisotropy. And so the shape anisotropy of a domain wall under these conditions would want it to be block. And if you have DMI, it can compensate uh, that shape anisotropy to force it to be nail. So the amount of DMI that's required to be successful to make it nail uh, depends on the shape anisotropy energy that goes as MS squared. So for cobalt platinum, MS is quite large. And MS squared then is also very large, which means you need a lot of DMI to stabilize a nail wall. For these garnets, MS is one or two orders of magnitude or even more smaller than it is for metals. Therefore, the amount of DMI that is required to stabilize a nail wall uh, 
is also much smaller. So because of the low MS in these materials, even though there's a relatively low DMI, that also turns out to have the opposite chirality for that of a cobalt platinum interface. It's sufficient to stabilize uh, chiral textures in these kinds of uh, films. We've looked at the roles of interfaces and for uh, platinum cobalt, um, it is the, the heavy metal, it's the, the platinum and the spinoric coupling that generates the DMI. What we found in these kinds of materials is that um, if you put a copper spacer between the platinum and the garnet, the DMI actually goes up. Whereas if, if you had a, a cobalt platinum interface and you, that did the same thing and you put a copper spacer, the DMI would, would go down. And so what that tends to suggest is that it's not the, the metal that is imparting the, the DMI, or at least not, not the spin orbit coupling of the metal. And likewise in these materials, uh, it, because you can make garnets with a variety of, of rare earths and you can make garnets without a rare earth, uh, we've looked at uh, the role of the rare earth itself in the garnet. Because again, you need a broken inversion symmetry and you need a strong spin orbit coupling. And what we found is that if we remove the rare earth and instead put in bismuth, which allows you to still get a PMA, the DMI vanishes. And uh, we find that the same kind of behavior for uh, using BLS. So we find that uh, whether or not we have a metal layer on top of a, a garnet, if the garnet does not contain a rare earth element, we find no evidence of DMI. Uh, when we look at uh, a variety of, of rare earths, we've looked at thulium, we've looked at, at, at terbium, uh, we've looked at, at more than are shown on this table. Um, uh, regardless of what the metal is on top, when there's a rare earth, we tend to get DMI. When there's no rare earth, we don't get a DMI. When we look at the temperature dependence, we find a very strong temperature dependence for the rare earth uh, uh, magnetic moment, the rare earth angular momentum. So presumably the rare earth spin orbit coupling. And when we look at the uh, temperature dependence of the DMI, we find a very similar strong scaling of this. So we believe that the data indicate so far that we need a broken uh, interfacial symmetry in these systems. But the spin orbit coupling that drives the DMI in the system is not coming from the metal, but it's coming from the rare earth that's in the garnet itself. So we're still trying to understand the origin of this, but that seems to be a particularly important ingredient. But nonetheless, with the, all of these ingredients, low damping, uh, uh, low dissipation and, and so forth, one can expect very high uh, velocities in these materials. And so for the last part of the, the, the talk, I wanna look at just what are, what are the limits of, of domain wall dynamics and can we push those limits in these kinds of, of garnet materials? So in conventional domain wall dynamics, I, I mentioned early in this talk, this idea of domain wall stiffness. When you drive a domain wall, if you start with a domain wall that is, that is nail, um, then in the schematic that I've shown here, the, the moment of that uh, domain wall would be pointing from left to right. So we've got a down domain, an up domain, and as you walk across the domain wall at the center of the wall, the magnetic moments would be pointing right. When you apply either a spin current or when, when you apply a magnetic field that would drive that wall, the torque doesn't displace the wall, but the torque instead drives the domain wall from being nail to being more and more block. There's then a restoring torque inside of the domain wall. And it's that restoring torque that propels the domain wall forward. So it's, it's really an indirect drive when you're driving a texture. The, the magnetic field or the spin orbit torque will cause a distortion of the wall. And the internal restoring torque is what then propels that domain wall forward. And because it, it is that internal restoring for, uh, torque, then there is a, a fundamental speed limit for spin texture dynamics for domain walls. And you could, you could see this, if the wall wants to be nail, then the furthest you could distort it from being nail would be to make it block. And that's the maximum restoring torque that you have. So that's the maximum velocity that you can get. With spin orbit torques, um, you'll never drive it beyond 90 degrees. So there's a plateau in the, in, the, in the velocity. And that plateau, that velocity is proportional to the domain wall stiffness. If you apply a magnetic field along the stripe, you can increase the stiffness and you can increase that uh, domain wall velocity. And that's been shown experimentally and that can be, has been shown uh, 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 experimentally. So, fundamentally for conventional domain wall dynamics, the maximum speed is proportional to the stiffness of, of a wall. And so, but eventually that, that has to give way. A, a domain wall can't move infinitely fast. Uh, 
And so, and you could apply in principle a, an infinitely large magnetic field to give an infinite stiffness to a wall. So what went, then limits the, the absolute maximum velocity that a wall or a spin texture can take? Well, domain wall is a soliton and one can think of a soliton as, as built up as a superposition of spin waves or magnons that then travels in a system. And those magnons uh, in a material will, will, depending on the material, have a maximum velocity. And anything that is constructed from this superposition should then also have a maximum velocity. So you might anticipate then that the maximum velocity that any kind of a, a solentonic structure could move should be limited by the maximum magnon group velocity. And uh, it, one can, can actually show this in a variety of systems that the dynamics at high speeds are, 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 are described by a sine Gordon equation. And the sine Gordon equation has built into it a Lorentz invariance. There's a velocity that plays essentially the same role as the speed of light in special relativity. And as you approach that speed of light in special relativity, we have Lorentz contraction, we have time dilation, and that limits the velocity of any kinematic object to the speed of light. Well, it turns out that there are predictions and we've shown that in these garnets. And let me just jump to that because I, I, I think my host showing up means I'm close to being done here. Um, that we've actually achieved this limit in, in these garnets that have low dissipation, low, low damping can be driven by spin orbit torques. And so the collection of figures here that you see on the left is the velocity versus current where you see this, this plateau. And that plateau, at least for low in plane fields is proportional to the stiffness of the, of the wall. And the bottom figure shows that plateau velocity as a function of in plane field. So the, the stiffer the wall is, the faster it can move, but there's always some limit. But then we find as we stiffen it more and more, the curves in the, in the bottom here tend to plateau out. So there's another velocity that even if we if, add additional stiffening to the wall, we can't drive it any faster. That velocity turns out to be the maximum magnon group velocity, which we can infer from the, from the, the, the magnon dispersion curve that we've measured. And again, let me just jump through this. Um, so in these materials, we've gone from this conventional domain wall dynamics where it is stiffness li limited to uh, this uh, relativistic like domain wall dynamics where what essentially happens is the domain wall velocity is always proportional to the domain wall width. As you drive it faster and faster, Lorentz contraction will increasingly decrease the domain wall width so that gamma delta over alpha, which is the mobility of the wall, will go down as the velocity goes up and that limits the velocity to the maximum magnum group velocity. So we've, we've, we've been able to in these kinds of, of, of materials that, that are at least close enough to compensation that we can get to these dynamics, uh, explore these relativistic kinematics in, in, in a way that, uh, that is, is quite intriguing and potentially important for potential device applications. So with that, let me just put up this uh, uh, very brief summary slide. And thank everyone for your for your attention. I'll be delighted to uh, to take any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Jeffrey. Let's <laughs> applause from the audience. Um, so there's uh, several questions. Uh, please raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question. Uh, from one of the panelists, uh, let's start with Matthias first. Uh, hey, Jeff. Uh, very nice work. Uh, two quick questions. Um, there are reports that the DMI in the garnet is resulting from the interface to the substrate. Is that also what you see, or does do you have a dependence on the metal overlayer? We we see a dependence on on both, and so it, I, I would from our work I would I would say it's difficult to to ascertain at this point. Okay. So what we what we don't think that we don't see it as the same mechanism as when you put platinum on cobalt. Okay. So it doesn't appear to be related to the spin orbit coupling. And that mm -hmm. you could see from the experiment where we put copper on, 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 mm -hmm. on top, but mm -hmm. there's a dependence on, the, on the, the metal, there's a dependence on the substrate, okay. but the, the key ingredient that we find is that you have to have a rare earth in the garnet. Mm, yeah, yeah. So our, our yeah. supposition is that, that somehow the spin orbit coupling from that rare earth mm -hmm. appears to be key to the, to the phenomena. But I would say okay. it's an open and, and very interesting question. As a second quick question. Um, now, uh, one of the problems with the ferry magnets tends to be that there is a very strong temperature dependence if you want to use them, because obviously there's a compensation. Now, there are also these compensated ferry magnets, like this manganese for nitride or manganese to ruthenium guard, gallium. Have you looked into that? Or is that also promising to look at dynamics in these compensated ferry magnets, which are compensated over a lot of wider temperature range? Uh, 
We have not looked at those particular materials, but but I think that's a very important uh, uh, thing to point out. Yes, that the temperature dependence here is is desirable to look at fundamentals, but it would be probably a killer for applications. And so, materials in which you can have that compensation behavior over a wide range is, is critically important. And so, the materials that you indicate, or the, you know, the ultimate direction here could be antiferromagnets where that that works everywhere the dynamics would be would be the same so i yes i, I think that that's that that's the direction for applications that one just has to go okay great thanks oh okay uh, your go ahead yeah hi Geoffrey, and thanks very much for this very nice talk i'm very interested in the garnets and i have a question that may sound trivial you were talking about um uh garnets with rare earths and without rare earths. Um, mm. I thought it was more about the strain and the elasticity because an yttrium iron garnet, if you dope it with bismuth, you still have the yttrium, which is per definition not a rare earth, uh, but still you use the strain to get the perpendicular anisotropy. Is it really so important that in some of these samples you really have rare earths or is it more about the strain that you induce because you grow all of them on GGG and if you use, for example, tulium iron garnet, you have much higher strain than if you use yttrium iron garnet. Oh yeah, thank, thank, thank you. And let me separate two things. So for the perpendicular anisotropy, Absolutely, you're you're correct. It's it's a it's a magnetostrictive anisotropy, and by by you know adding bismuth or controlling the rare earth, you can control that contribution, and therefore for a given uh, substrate, you can potentially design the right additive to get you know to get the magnetostriction that will give you an out of plane anisotropy. But so yes, so that is that is a you know an, a magnetostrictive anisotropy engineering question. For the DMI, however. We, we believe that, that that is something that is more more intrinsic. Again, we don't have something mechanistic, but the absence of, of, of the rare earth, uh, we find that to be correlated with an absence of DMI. So with the bismuth yig, for example, as you indicate, that that has a, a, a magnetostriction that allows it to get PMA, but we don't see DMI no matter what metal we put on that material. And likewise for the temperature dependence, we find that the DMI in the rare earth containing iron garnet has a temperature dependence that tracks qualitatively the temperature dependence of the orbital moment of that rare earth. Okay. So Thanks. circumstantial, but that's 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 simply the, the experimental results that we have at this point. Great. Okay. Thank you. So let me ask a question that was on the chat. Um, because David doesn't have the, 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 uh, the microphone. So in a full operation of race track memory devices, it requires energy to nucleate domain walls or skirmions uh, to push to read uh, while the STT M rounds devices requires energy to switch on MTJ and read uh, via TMR. Typically, by the currents requires to push domain walls uh, motion is 10 times larger than the STT switching uh, currents in the MTJs. It seems that the race track memory will cost more energy compared to the STT RAMs. Uh, and he wants he would like you to comment on that. So that 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 I that I agree. Um, that that it is it is always a difficult problem for driving either domain walls or skirmions. And the, the current densities that are required to do that reliable remain very large. And they remain very large despite a, a number of years of work on on the on the materials. Um, and you know the other important thing that goes hand in hand to that is that the, the threshold currents are typically related to extrinsic defects. Okay. And therefore there's stochasticity, which would also be a, be a, a killer for a racetrack memory in which you have to operate it 10 billion times and not lose a, a bit. On the other hand, there are a lot of other applications besides mass storage devices that you know are, are digital devices that require close to perfection um, where where these phenomena could be could be of utility, so things like neuromorphic computing and and you know other uh, other things. So that, for example, the the nucleation and the and the gating that that I described by voltage, that is something that you know would would not be fast enough to compete with a CMOS switch device, but the power consumption is is uh, potentially very very low. So I think there are potential applications where at least a subset of the of the uh, functionalities could be could be of use. Okay, very good. But it's they're difficult problems. If you're trying to displace a technology with something that that's very new and different, it, it's a difficult thing to to do. Certainly. 
So we go first with Arnab and then with Carl. Arnab, go ahead and unmute yourself if you want to ask your question. You've been given permission to talk. I'm not sure if this doesn't seem to be responding. So let's go with Carl. Carl, go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, everybody. And hi, 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 Jeff. I don't think we've actually spoken since you visited us about 25 years ago. It's <laughs> really nice to see you. born then. <laughs> or whenever it was. But this is an amazing talk. And uh, it touched on many things that uh, I'm in love with, from domain wall structure and dynamics to solitons. I can't believe you covered so much ground. But uh, I have one observation, which I just realized in one question. I, won't, I want to talk to you later uh, offline sometime. But uh, the first thing is, uh, I just realized that the first paper I ever published uh, involved uh, domain wall mobility with opposite chirality nail walls. We didn't know that term back then, but uh, my first paper, we applied a transverse field to a permaloy film, nucleated a nail wall and measured its velocity. And then we reversed the transverse field and nucleated what you would now call, a, I called a reverse nail wall and measured the, the mobility. And of course, the forward nail wall, which I guess you would call positive chirality, moved faster than the negative one. But we didn't know what all this stuff related to back then. So that was fun to see you connect that to chirality because as an old guy, I have a heck of a time keeping up with all of this great work you guys are doing. But one of my thoughts, uh, again, triggered by your excellent talk, is the emphasis on the effect of stray fields. And uh, I learned way back then when I was a graduate student that nail walls had zero stray field in the limit of zero thickness, and block walls have zero stray field in the, inf in the limit of infinite thickness. And uh, back then, we measured velocities, can see the transition, but as you may know, and there are beautiful bitter patterns of this, in the middle of that transition for a permalloy film, it's say a thousand angstrom thick, oh, a hundred nanometers, sorry. <laughs> uh, there are these troublesome structures called cross ties. Mm -hmm. Beautiful structures that show up in bitter patterns. And uh, many of the old people worked hard to analyze cross tie walls. Is there any analog to this transition in, in skirmions and, and uh, the kind of things you were talking about between the nail wall and block walls that do you see anything like cross ties in a skirmion, for example? Oh yeah, that, that's, a, that's a very good question. So for, for all of these PMA-like uh, materials, the walker breakdown will, will, will happen by the injection of block points that will move along the wall you know, in the very, very similar way has been known for, for quite some time. The threshold for that to occur, if you're driving by field, the threshold for that to occur will, will be increased as you have a, a DMI. But you know, all of the energetics and all of the dynamics are you know, exactly as, as, as you and your colleagues have, have described many, many years ago. The DMI is just adding an extra energy term or dynamically an extra torque term to, uh, to those equations. But they, you know, they can be injected, they can propagate along the, the, the wall and then influence the dynamics. And there was, early in the talk, I, I showed uh, one of these simulations for a multi-layer, which is you know, just a stack of, of coupled domain walls or a stack of, of coupled skirmions. And that's exactly what, what happens. There's a, there's, you know, in one of these structures where the, uh, you know, it's, it's very close to a nail to block transition, that's where the, the processional dynamics begins. And you know, instead of processional dynamics being coherent across the whole domain wall, it will, it will begin locally, which is just a propagating a, 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 a point in that system. Ah, uh, yes, block points. I, I been mm -hmm. very fascinating. Thank you, Jeff. Amazing talk. Thank you, Carl. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice to see you. Okay, good. So I think we've come to the conclusion of the talk and the question A. I want to thank you, uh, Jeffrey. Wonderful talk as always. It's amazing how much energy you have to do all these things you do, uh, and how you know. The, the, what I love is that you know when we write that we know our uh, you know 
particularly theorists, you know, that we're going to make a difference in science, in the technology, and really do devices. You actually take it very, very seriously and actually try to make them work, uh, which is, is, is uh, wonderful to see, uh, I must say. Um, and so with that, I uh, thank all of you. Uh, please stay safe again uh, and uh, enjoy the, for, for Jeffrey has the rest of the day ahead of him. Uh, for us in the Germany, Freiabend, and a nice uh, rest of the evening. Uh, and for those in the Asia, of course, uh, good evening as well. So thank you all again, and uh, we we'll hope to see you again to, in the next few days, in, in the next uh, iteration of it. Uh, so thanks, Jeffrey. That was a great talk. I'll stop now the streaming. And I think, thank of you. course, thank there was, so a, there was uh, just so you know, there was, uh, we had 185 people watching you today. So you, you, you. Oh, 